Welcome to Once in Earth, the original. I'm Leanne Meyer, and I'm so happy to be back with you and introducing yet another very interesting guest. I'm finding that um, as I'm preparing for these, the Power Up Conference that we are going to be having in uh, June 22nd through the 24th, I've been having this opportunity to meet with so many of the speakers and the sponsors that it has been really, really exciting. I'm getting more excited about it all the time. Um, my particular speaker today is somebody that I just met um, since the beginning of uh, 2023. And yet from the very first time I spoke with her, I had the feeling that everything she was saying was in my brain. Um, how she teaches was the way I teach. Um, and so we're actually going to be doing a session together at the Power Up Nursing. And I think it's just going to be so much fun. So I'm looking forward to that. So um, I might as well bring her in. My guest is uh, Lillian DeVries, and I'm using the English trans uh, um, pronunciation. Uh, my uh, cohort, Tanya Abreu, who is actually my, pod my uh, podcast um, producer today is in the background and she speaks French and she can say your name so beautifully. So um, I'm going to ask you to say it in French just so yes. people can hear how beautiful it is. Well, actually, it's not a French name, to be honest. <laughs> My maiden name was Boulanger, which was a French name. This name is South African. It's my husband's name, uh, South African. So it's Dutch. So it's it's actually pronounced, the V is like an F. So it's like de Fries. De Fries. De Fries. De Fries. Yeah. So the little and Dutch do you, accent. Do you say Lillian in French, though? Is it Was it always Lillian? Because that's the way you had said it to me. And I think you're frozen. <laughs> so um, that's interesting. We've had a lot of things happen on the podcast, and this is not one of them. <laughs> so um, I will have to wait for just a couple of seconds here, I'm, I'm afraid. Ah, we're here. Before you come back. <laughs> Hello. Hello again. <laughs> At least you were not in a frozen state of, you know, some kind of crazy ex <laughs> you're right exactly that's usually what happens so uh -huh. let's hope we don't have that i was just asking you to say your name uh do you yeah. your name is french though right lillian and yeah well lillian is the french way of saying lillian but uh de Fries. De Fries is the is the uh, dutch south african accent yeah okay well we've got that taken care of um what i do with all of my guests is i always ask if you could it, rather than my trying to uh, give your bio, I think it's so much more interesting to nurses to hear how you came into nursing and then mm. how that took you to where you are now, which is a mm. fascinating story. Yes, yes. Thank you for that. Uh, first, I'm so excited to be here, uh, Leanne, like sisters from another mother for sure. Yeah. Um, yes. And so what brought me to nursing? Great question. You know, my father, my parents are from France and my, fa <laughs> the, my father was in the resistance during the war. And so my father did some, I guess, some nursing care, un unprofessional nursing care in his, in his days. Uh, but he always wanted me to go into nursing for some reason. He just said, you're going to be a nurse. And you know what? I listened to him. I just <laughs> pursued it. I said, you know, I care a lot about people. I had, I guess, a natural ability to, to care and to be, you know, uh, diligent to, to service. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I pursued the nursing and, um, and through the years, I went from, you know, it was all bedside nursing. It was uh, mostly oncology that I worked in. And then I did some um, gerontology, some, you know, women's health, that kind of thing. Uh, and I eventually stepped away to help my parents in their restaurant business. Um, and through that was still working as a nurse, but part time, started a family and I went through some of the struggles where I just felt that nursing was changing quite a bit and I didn't know how to make it better. I was, I was one of those, I see the nurses today and I see myself in them um, in the days way back when things were changing. Uh, we were, you know, certainly not the same situation that we are today, but there were cutbacks, there were, you know, stressors. 
I didn't know how to help my team of nurses. That was my, in my heart, I felt like I was devoted to the patients and I was devoted to the nurses, but I just didn't know how to help. And so I kind of stepped away, even though I kept my foot in it, um, and pursued working in pharmacology um, in customer service, worked in the restaurant with my family. I had my hands in all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And I became a team leader, so I found my voice in different ways and discovered coaching. Uh, through a program, I actually stepped into a program called Workplace Wellness and Health Promotion, when wellness was the buzzword, right? <laughs> um, and I thought, oh, I need to go back into healthcare uh, so badly to help them with their wellness and their well-being. And in that component, I discovered coaching. And I thought, wow, this is a calling. This is the coaching with the nurses. So it was, although I really, really, really miss the bedside, I really feel that the calling is bigger for helping the nurses. Mm -hmm. um, so I've worked it, as a coach nurse in organizations, always starting at the top. And by the time we got to the nurse um, side by side, I, you know, mergers happened and all of a sudden new leadership and we started back up at the top. And it was very frustrating because I created this whole nursing leadership program. I yeah. wanted to make sure that I was serving nurses. And, uh, you know, I think the gift in COVID has really been that it's taken me down that route full time. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think that, uh, you know, timing is everything. It's where you're supposed to be. It Just is. Watch, uh, watch for the light that guides you. It's one of the things that I've been especially uh, noticing lately in these last couple of years when I've been involved in nurses transforming healthcare and then also with this power of nursing um, was that I feel like every single life experience I've had, every challenge, every problem, every everything has led me to the point of being in the right place at the right time to maybe be able to make a difference here and now. And mm -hmm. that um, just, uh, I can't even describe the feeling that that is. It, it just, um, it, it yeah. um, wakes me up. It, it, it yes. wakes up my life, wakes up my thinking and makes me want to, you know, keep striving. And yes. nurses, I've always said, I love nurses. And I love them more now than ever, especially as I see how they're struggling. You actually are the kind of person I was praying for three, three years ago when COVID first started. And what I kept hoping that, that the administrations would realize is that they would get how vitally important the nurses were to every aspect of the success of their organization. Mm -hmm. And that from that, they would provide a wealth of support uh, for every aspect that they needed, um, that they would have people there 24 hours a day that, that a nurse could talk to, could cry on their shoulder, could just express what it was that they are experiencing. And yes. when that didn't happen, I started suggesting it because I just couldn't imagine how could people not be thinking of this. Um, and then I, I just, uh, for six months, I almost drove myself insane trying to figure out how do I connect with those people who can already do that and make sure that they are getting to the nurses. And the hardest thing about that was that nurses were so busy being wildly um insane. I mean, they were working insane hours. They were doing insane things. They didn't even have the, the energy or the momentum or the whatever to be able to know that there were some things out there for them or even that they needed them. So talk about that a little bit. When did you see nurses starting to wake up to their you know, needs? Yeah. I, I think, the, again, the gift in COVID is for them to wake up. I really, I really think so. Um, I've got to tell you on my own personal journey, I, I attempted to work with nurses and then I stepped back because I had to work on my own work, which was the frustration I had with nurses. Mm -hmm. I, you know, when I approached them and said, it doesn't matter what organization I went to, people were all ready to invest in, in themselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, organizations pay for, you know, their people, but, but also people pay for themselves. And the one thing that I kept hearing over and over again with nurses is the system owes me. You know, the organization owes me. They need to do something for me. Why should I dish out money out of my pocket? And I, and I, my response was always, how's that working for you? Yeah. You know, <laughs> really? Like, yeah. seriously, ask yourself, when you keep waiting for everybody else to make your life happy, how is that working for you? Mm -hmm. You know, we are responsible for ourselves. And, 
And the best way to do that is working with somebody. I mean, I did it. I've been working with my own coach. I've changed coaches, but along the way, but I've worked for 25 years with my coach, you know, a coach by my side, sometimes helping me in my business, sometimes helping me in my personal life, whatever my attention or wherever my attention needed to be. I had that partner on my journey who was invested in what I wanted, not telling me what I needed to do, uh -huh. but invested in what I wanted and helping me discover what I wanted. Yeah. Because it's so easy to complain. Yes. You know, it's and so it, easy. It's like it uh, absolves us. There's nothing else I need to do because I just have to wait until they come through. Yeah. Um, I don't even remember exactly when it happened, but it was sort of like this aha moment for me where I realized oh my gosh, I have adopted this attitude that I've got everything completely uh, situated and all I need to do, you know, everything that's my problem is actually out there. Somebody else is responsible for the misery that I'm having. <laughs> I turned off my phone here. I thought I had turned it off yeah. before. Yeah, and, um, and that doesn't work. It doesn't work to, 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 to blame, on, to put the pain. Well, you see, that's what it is. It's you're feeling pain and you want to, take it yeah. off yourself. So you put the blame on somebody else. So that's one part of, you know, well, what we do. The, coaching the realization to that story is that I came to my realization that if I uh, had to wait until everybody else had themselves figured out and, and were following along with my plan, it was yes. going to be a very long wait before I came to the top of their, you know, priority list. And yes. I thought that was hilarious when I finally came to that realization. Oh my gosh, I'm waiting for the world to change. It's going to be a really long wait. Yeah. Um, that was when I think I started to really say, okay, it's up to me. I'm the only yes. one to make it good for me. And the challenge with that is that because many nurses are feeling the same as, you know, I was at that time, um, we have our allies. We have our allies that are there going, you know, I agree with you. You know, you're absolutely right. This is terrible. And this, you know, and, and I'd be like, yes. And for two years, I found myself surrounded by these people. And one day I woke up and went, why am I hanging around people who agree with me? It's not getting me anywhere. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's exactly. when I started to change my surroundings. Yeah. And to be honest, you know, I have a little story behind this that when my biggest change happened, was at the very beginning of my uh, of my coaching career, and I I was just you know crying and upset because this is not what I signed up for, you know, in that place of total devastation, thinking there's no way out, you know, and and everybody else is the problem. We've talked about that, um, and I I left the house for three days, and and I came back and I did that a couple times, but the one the last time I came back, I said to my husband. And my kids, I sat them down in the kitchen and I said, okay, this is it. I'm doing Project Lil. And they went, okay. And I could see my husband was, you know, turning white and my my kids were going, oh, here she goes again, you know. <laughs> and, and I said, uh, honey, I'm moving out of the bedroom. Kids, if you need something, dad's the one who's going to be in charge. I hadn't forewarned my husband. I just came in with, I wasn't going to have a discussion about this. This is a firm decision. Now I'm not saying everybody has to take six months right. off and do this for themselves, but that's how I handled it because at that point I wasn't working with a coach, but I knew I had to do something because otherwise I was not going to be able to be there for anyone. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. I took six months and you know, the biggest lesson I learned was in the first hour of those six months, I suddenly had permission to do what I needed to do for myself. And I had absolutely nobody to blame if I failed. Yeah. And, and I just went, oh, my word, this is all on me now. <laughs> but, you know, that was the biggest lesson. And and I can't tell you enough that when you start to work with somebody. So that was my six month project for me. But when you start to work with somebody and somebody starts calling you on stuff that's not serving you. And I talked about this with uh, Tanya this morning, um, you know, saying we get into comfort zones. But is that comfort zone serving us? Mm hmm. Sometimes our comfort zones are very painful, but it's all we know. And we need somebody to hold our hand to get out of there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we can lose ourselves. We talk ourselves into that there really is nothing I can do. I did that for years at the bedside thinking, this is not good. These, you know, they're, I actually had the fortune of always working with some pretty uh, amazing, wonderful people. 
but still in the environment that was around the people that I was working with um, was often quite toxic. And so uh, I had the fortune of being able to be in an organization with some tremendous leaders, true leaders. Um, and they started working with Quint Studer. I don't know if you've heard of him. Yes, yes. The Studer, uh, I forgot, Studer plan, Studer's up the Studer's. Yeah, yeah I remember story. Studer. Anyway, um, they worked with us for about four years. And it, of course, it was all around uh, being kind and generous with each other, uh, managing up, which I had no idea what that was. But instead of tearing people down, which tends to, tended to be the major um, part, uh, thing to, for nurses to do at the at the desk, is you know tear down whoever wasn't there, and the idea of building people up, especially to the next shift. So you know you're telling your patient um, you're going to have Barb next shift, and she is fantastic. You're going to love yeah. her. Um, you know she um, is really going to be able to work well with you. And so even if that wasn't the case, because the expectation was planted, then that was their experience. Yeah. The other thing, we have so many parallels. So I don't know if it would have been exactly at the same time you were doing it, but I did take a step into uh, coaching also. Um, however, for me, I had so many health issues that I just couldn't give it the time it needed. And I ended up using the skills that I learned. I took the whole co coaching courses, um, but then just used those skills in various different ways that I was working on other things. And then also through my husband, I married late in life. So at 47, I married and my husband was able to show me how I was um, a hindrance in my family of origin. I always saw myself as the uh, the cog in the middle of the wheel that kept everyone connected. And the mm. reality was I was keeping everybody from each other. I, mm. I started out as a child um, looking at myself as the, um, the messenger behind enemy lines. My parents and my brothers were always at it and never could understand each other. So because I was on the outside and looking in, I had all knowing concept and wisdom of what needed to happen. And so when he pointed that out to me, and it really came down to me that, oh my gosh, I have not been helping here. I've actually been hindering, you know, the mm. relationship of these yes. four people. And I took a year off from my family, which they didn't wow. understand at all. Uh -huh. Even though I, I tried, I sent letters and tried to explain, but they have no idea. Right. But in that time, I realized I was the problem more than I was the solution. And mm. Lo and behold, when I step back, they start talking to each other. There you go. Yeah. You know, so yeah. Again. I'm yeah. I think what you're pointing to, uh, you know, starting even with the, the Studer group, Studer group, that's what it was. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the challenge that happens with those things is that they're trying to make the organization better and they're trying to make the relationships better, but they're not, and I'm not talking specifically with student group, I'm talking about in general, mm -hmm. when we're creating things, we're trying to make people work better together, be kind to each other. The challenge I have with that is that we're not looking at what's going on internally with each person. Mm -hmm. And so there's a beautiful quote that's anonymous quote, but I, I, I bring it up often with my, you know, uh, when I'm talking or, or with clients and it is, what is hurting you so much, Leanne, that you feel the need to hurt me? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, let me find out what's going on over there. And it's not all about me all the time. Right? And if I can understand, and that's part of forgiveness to me. Forgiveness is, you know, when a nurse, uh, you know, and I'm going to use nurse because we're talking about it. Um, when a nurse, you know, snaps back at me or something, I say, first of all, it's not about me. Or if it is, then I need to look into that. Um, and there's also a better way of saying it to me, but I look and say, what's going on over there. And, and with the forgiveness to me is if she knew how to do better. And I say she in general, if she knew how to do better, she would have, if she knew how to express her feelings, she would have, if she knew how to cope with her challenges, she would have people don't do it spitefully. And, and, you know, I've had arguments about that. Um, I don't think people are they might be intentionally spiteful on the outside, but underneath there's a cause for it. Yeah. And so we need to, you know, it's psychology 101 here. It's going underneath and looking at what's your history? What, what are your worldviews? 
what that's, that's how I work with my with my uh, clients is looking deeply where are you coming from mm -hmm. and what you know how is that serving you what are your beliefs what are your foundational beliefs that have you handle your challenges in this way and is it working or not working and what's the you know you may have intentions you had great intentions with your family mm -hmm. but what was the yeah. impact because our intentions don't always match our our impact it's absolutely right? So, talk to, talk to me yeah. about relationship-centered care. You actually uh, trademark that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Relationship-centered care to me is, is um, it starts with relationship with self, mm -hmm. right? You cannot be in good relationship with someone else. Uh, and let's take our coworkers and our families and our patients. If we're not in good relationship with ourselves. what does that mean? It means understanding why I do what I do, how I think, what are my patterns, um, understanding really um, the, the essence of who I am and how I am in relationship with myself. When I start judging myself, when mm -hmm. I start putting myself down and, and, uh, and when I don't think that I'm worthy or all those things, it begins there. Because if I don't look at that, I cannot show up authentically real and kind and human. Right. And when I talk about humanity, it's being seen, heard, and acknowledged. I need to see myself. Yeah. I need to hear myself. And I need to acknowledge who I am, good or bad, you know, as we may judge it, um, and understand where that's coming from. Then I work at then my relationship one-on-one -on -one with people or in groups. And then I can be there for my patients. When did that start, that realization start that you had to start with you? When when did it start? Was it in it's, nursing? It was it, it in started at very, very back uh, beginning of my coaching years. Um, uh, you know, and I've got a wonderful husband that he's just the perfect mate to to bring out the, you know, the the things I need to work on. You know, uh, I, I realized be careful if you try to make the person, your spouse, the person you want them to be, because then you, you need to turn the, the mirror to yourself. You know, yeah. um, I can't, I can't ask him to be something if I'm not already that. Right. Um, and, and we're different, but when did I realize it was really uh, at the beginning of my coaching years, because I did relationship systems coaching. I took uh, a course in that uh, and learned about relationships and about the third entity um, mm -hmm. about, we are in relationship right now, Leanne, but that, third entity is the relationship. So you are you, I am, I, I am myself, right. but the third entity is the relationship, the overlap between us. Right. Exactly. And, and so what do we need from each other in order to make that relationship as healthy and rich as possible? So what do you need me to give to this relationship? And mm -hmm. what am I willing to receive from this relationship? And it's not always good. Sometimes it's feedback that, mm -hmm. you know, is for me to grow. So, and, and and words are really important. You know, I love Tanya because she's my wordsmith. Yeah, she's such a word, you know. Yeah. yeah. So you know, we can use the same word. We can say, hey, you know, I want I want trust in my relationship. Well, what does that mean? Let's mm -hmm. let's break that down. What does the word trust mean? Right? Um, because I could be doing something and thinking, that's fine. Why should I have to tell you everything? I think you can trust me. And, and then you go, no, <laughs> I need more. I need more information. So it's you know. Here's the thing, um, um, and, and maybe you have another thought beyond it, but when we're asking other people to trust us, how many mm -hmm. times do we not trust ourselves? <laughs> and so if we yeah. cannot rely on ourselves to look out for us or to be trustworthy or have the integrity to really hold ourselves to the highest standard, how on earth could we expect somebody else to do that? Yeah, and I think that's an, it's, it's an ongoing it's an ongoing development. I don't think it's like, okay, now I trust you and that's it. I think something uh -huh. comes up and we, we, you know, we readjust things. Um, but I like where you're going with, you know, how do I trust myself? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what comes to mind when I hear that is, is when I'm, when I'm doubting myself, when I'm in that place of not sure if I've done the right thing or if, you know, or what thing I should be doing, whatever that means, um, I need that, I need that partnership with somebody to, to process that, just put it on right. a sounding board and get, and get some feedback on it. Yeah. Um, which kind of takes me to the, you know, I speak of it as a need because to me, it's a want, I want it. I want that partnership. I want that sounding board. I want that person in my life to, to, 
to see me. Um, and so therefore it becomes and a need for me anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And love me anyway. Yeah. Um, and there are some people who don't feel that that's a need uh, because it's not yet a want. Mm. I think that that's really, you know, we need to want it. What's the hunger? What's the hunger? Yeah. Uh, we need to be hungry for things. Yeah. And yeah, that's so different. And, and our knees have to be shaking. I, I remember hearing people say, if your knees aren't shaking, you're not, your, your dream or your goal or whatever it is, is not big enough. And it's not big enough. My knees have been shaking for the last three years. So I think that. Yes. Yeah. yes. It's funny. I've just got this on my desk, actually, just talking about, you know, these tools that we use in coaching, right? Um, I attended this workshop years back and I just redid a refresher the other day and it's, it's called the bigger game, play the bigger game with um, mm -hmm. uh, what's his name? Uh, Rick Tamlin. And he talks about, you know, are you in the gulp stage? Um, you know, are you still assessing? Are you taking bold action? And I like the top one is hunger, you know, or your comfort zones and all that. So sometimes working with little tools like that with clients helps them to see things differently than just mm -hmm. talking. Right. Well, and the other thing with nurses, and maybe it's just me, but it seems like there is a pattern here. I will tend not to take those big leaps for myself, but I will for other people. And particularly now, I have been able to put myself on the edge of the limb for nurses because I love nurses. And, and in some ways, that's how I love myself because I mm -hmm. do see myself as part of that realm. And yeah. I think you must too. Yes. Um, yes. And uh, where I go with that is sometimes is, is it really a calling? Is it really, you know, and I think we've checked in with ourselves. We know that. But there's also that place where people do things more for others than themselves because they have what we call a, a saboteur um, in our mind that's the pleaser. We need to please yeah. to get significance in our life, yeah. you know, uh, to feel like we're worthy of something. Um, so that's part, that's the job of a coach where I sit down and I can look at that and say, well, where is that really coming from? And some of that, um, is that what I was doing with my family, that savior complex. Mm -hmm. Um, I forget now there was a number of books that I was using for a while in training and it was basically kind of, um, dealing with the Messiah complex, I believe mm -hmm. is what, what they talked about. And they okay. said that nurses particularly seem to have this, you know, that, we may not have ourselves together, but boy, we can solve everybody else's problem. We can, you know, take on the world for somebody else, but um, we're, we're really kind of a mess ourselves. Yes. So I want to go back again to what you were talking about is getting to know yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I'd call that the hard work. And what I realize is that there are not a lot of people that want to put themselves through it. Even people that I admire or I know well, um, when I start talking about the kind of work I'm doing for myself, they're kind of like, okay, um, don't want to go there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so perspective and words, again, we go back to words. Uh, <laughs> if we could look at that, yeah, if we could look at that, uh, hard work. So I would put you in that perspective and say, okay, if it's hard work, how, do, how does that sit in your body? What's the resistance? What are the possibilities here? Then I can switch that and say, well, what's another way of saying this work? And it might be, it's like, I get to discover myself. Yeah. Okay, well, where does that sit in the body? How does that feel? How different is that? What's the world of possibilities from that perspective? Same work. We've just reworded it. We've, re mm -hmm. we've, we've repositioned yeah. it in our body and we need to make it fun. And so I go there with clients. We start off with, you know, or may start off, not always the same way, um, looking at what are your values? You know, what are your passions? And not just big passion purpose. It's like passions, things. And I have one client who doesn't like the word passions. Uh, I'm laughing right now because we had to reword that. And it was like, what are the things I like to do? Just uh -huh. and that, just the reframing the words made it different for her. Passions felt like it was too big. Yeah. Um, and so we looked at, what are, you know, and so for her, it was like music. Yeah. What is it about music? Well, it helps me feel grounded. And what is it about feeling grounded? Right. And so we start to play Take it deeper and deeper. It's the onion. We're peeling the onion. Right. And then you start to notice that another passion comes up or another thing you like to do comes up and you, some words start to come up and, and noticing when I did my passion map and I did one with my husband together, we did one together the word connection came up 
it came up numerous times and it was just like a, a strong, and it was ended up being my top value, you know, that if I wasn't living from a place of connection, everything that I was doing, I wasn't living. I didn't feel alive. And, you know, the origin of my company name, Alive in Healthcare, it was like alive. It's like, it brings me joy no matter what, because joy is, is an attitude that defies the circumstances right. that I could find, you know, if I was in the worst scenario, like in the middle of a flood, I can remember this when the house was flooding and I'm there with, you know, buckets and, and my daughter and her friend. And I'm thinking, we're doing this together. We're connected in the worst situation, but we're doing this together. And I'm going, that's, that's what I'm longing for. And it becomes a golden memory. Even though, you know, that was a yes. very difficult thing, it becomes a golden memory of connection. And especially yes. in this world where we are diver diverting from each other, um, yeah. where it's becoming more and more difficult. I mean, it's always been difficult. Yeah, that's part of Isn't it. Isn't that how we're connected? <clears throat> but um, I know you, I, I want to point out that you interviewed Tanya just a little bit uh, this morning. And... Uh, <laughs> the that whole concept of connection um mm. was one of the things that you know really connected with me too is that you know what some people call connection is not connection that when That's you right. have a connection there is such a deep heart to heart soul to soul concept actually the feeling that i had with you in the first conversation that we had is that and it just happened again now when you were talking about perspectives because uh, when I finally realized that perspective is reality for us and we can oh, choose yes. our perspective. I did not know that. It was such yes. a shock. The other part of it was you were talking about um, really appreciating uh, ourselves. Um, I never was able to do that until I started training to teach um, Myers-Briggs. Mm -hmm. And in learning about myself, I found out that I was a very unusual personality of the 16 possible personalities. Mine is ENFJ. And that is like in the one to 3% of all people, uh, yes. particularly in the United States have that, that uh, personality type. And I was like, well, no wonder I couldn't fit in in a small town. And in yeah. my own family, I was the opposite. But as I started to be able to say, yes, you know, as I learned about that personality type, I was like, yes, that is me. That is yes. me. And I, I noticed, noticed just being discovering it. who you are. Yeah. yeah. And that I yeah. could appreciate those are things I admire. And yeah. oh my goodness, that's in my personality. Yes. So, yes. And embrace embracing who we are. And, and we need to learn that. that so that's, yeah. that's the hard work or, you know, the fun discovery. I mean, whichever way you want to take it on. Right. Um, so yeah, re what I love in working with clients is, or anybody talking to anybody really, yeah. is that when their perception is not serving them, that how quickly we can change that perspe perspective. Yeah. It's so, it's an easy thing to do. But it's even very easy thing been to do. holding on to for a very long time, those yeah. people are such and so. Uh, this uh, organization is such and so. Um, yeah you know, people, these people don't support me. Those kinds of perspectives do not serve us because no. you have no control over anybody else. The only one you have control over is yourself. So until you change the perspective to, oh, what would I like to do to change this? Yes. And everything, yes. everything changes at that moment. Yeah. I love it. The perspective work is, it, it's fascinating and body work in that because um, it's one thing to talk with our minds and our mouths, you know, um, but it's another thing to stand up and experience it in your body, to yeah. really engage your body in, in the experience. Uh, so different, so different. Yes. Um, and to hold each other high in that, in that, you know, for me as a coach working with, with nurses, I hold them up high, especially, I think more so my experience having met Julianne, having, you know, been part of the, uh, nurses transforming healthcare, now going to this event, I mean, there's so many other things in my life that have made me realize how powerful nurses are, mm -hmm. how, you know, first of all, they're human beings. Mm -hmm. So every human being has, has power, but I think nurses with their, you know, their 
um, skills that they've learned, uh, their commitment to the unknown and dealing with the unknown in the best way possible. I think all of that has really enriched my perspective and I've always held my clients high, but I think I hold them even higher now. Um, if that ever was possible, but it's true. It's like, yeah. it's, it's, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. And, and I talked with Tanya this morning about building our community. Like we have created a community. Yeah. We know we can lean in to each other um, and have these conversations that matter. And then somebody will say, okay, so how do we take that to action? Right. Yeah. Because we could talk for a long time, but yeah. how do we take these things to action? Which is hence the reason for me going down to this power up nursing uh, conference, June 22nd to 24th is how do I take that to action? So action for myself and action for others and offer them uh, that possibility. Cause the importance for me, especially in a conference or lunch and learns, you go in there, you get pumped up and then it's like, you put everything in a drawer and you don't look at it for 20 years until you've had to move or something. Yeah. Right. Um, I am so, so adamant that when I'm at a conference and speaking that the next piece has to, there's needs to be a next action step. Yeah. Not just calling them forth to have a call with me. That's one thing or join my community, join the movement. Um, Nurses reclaim life. That's a movement, that, a community that I've developed, but also what is it you're ready for today? And and I, I can promise you, those who are coming to Power Up Nursing, there's going to be a follow up, and your follow up is going to be first with you, and then and then with us, <laughs> yeah. whoever us is, right? Yeah. But there's going to be that because because we know you care about yourself. You may not have tapped into that as being your priority, but that's what I'm calling forth. I'm calling forth that you need to care as much about yourself as I care about you. I just have to laugh because it, it happens again and again and again when you and I are talking. It's like I have something, a thought in mind that I want to pursue. And before I can get it out, you're saying the exact same thing. That is yeah. exactly what I was going to go yeah. to was join the movement. And I, it no more went through my brain than it came out your mouth. Yeah. It's just, yeah. I don't know if I've ever experienced anything quite this interesting as far as, <laughs> you know, sisters of another mother. It's It just... It, amazes me all the time. Um, so as we're looking toward power up nursing and, and also nurses transforming healthcare, um, it's something that gets me really excited because it seems to attract people with ideas, people who want to do that. They don't want to sit back and say, you know, those bad guys, they really want to come together and say, okay, who are the good guys? Who are the people who are uh, willing to take this risk, make these changes, discuss things that might upset other people or not be what they like. Um, and again, it goes back to if you have a strong concept of who you are, you can much more um, bear the, the, the uh, bows and arrows, the arrows and stones of other people because you can recognize that's fine. That's where they're coming from. I can learn from them, but it doesn't yeah. have to destroy me or, or change my course unless I choose to do that. So, yeah, and I would, yeah, sorry, you were going to ask something. I was going to go on to something else. So go ahead. Yeah, no, I just, I want to really, um, what I really want to encourage people is that you do not need to have an answer. Um, when you're connecting with like-minded people, whatever that means to you, there is something that organically happens. And I was, again, I was saying to Tanya this morning, when we can have a, con for, for me, the richest conversations are the ones that I walk away with, with more questions than answers. Yeah. Because that's where the land of possibility, the land of magic, the land of dreams, the land of anything can happen when we collectively come together and put our, our thoughts, th things evolve and, and we become influencers of the change mm -hmm. and we don't have to be attached to what the change is yet. Yeah. We just need to be part of that conversation to, to help it manifest. Mm -hmm. um, like, I don't know where nursing is heading and I don't know what part I play 
bigger than what I'm playing right now. And it could be bigger. It could, I don't know. And it could change. I have no idea, but I'm in it. And I'm in it to learn and to look at the possibility. I think the land of possibilities, magic and dreams is just, yeah. it's such a beautiful place. And it brings back our childhood without all the, the hurt and experiences. It just allows us to play. Come the other play. quote I keep using again and again and again, it was something I learned quite a while ago. And when I first heard it, I thought it was the dumbest thing I ever heard. <laughs> but it basically says that um, impossible situations are cleverly disguised or um, opportunity is cleverly described, disguised as impossible situations. And yes. how many times does that happen? And you look at history, um, you know, where people came up against impossible situations, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, don't have enough food, can't get through the winter, all these people are going to die, disease, whatever it is. And somehow somebody sees it as an opportunity and they make mm -hmm. good out of it. And it's just, all the time. you know, when, you know, if we feel like our back is against the wall, okay, what am I going to do different that I haven't tried before? And yeah. those are the people that start to influence everybody else. Yeah. And where you showed your chart before? Yes. It occurs to me that I think nurses that are finally starting to talk about what's going to happen in nursing going forward are not getting big enough. They're not mm. looking at this question big enough. And yeah, I would like to see, yeah, I would like to see us thinking in terms of the who we are as people and the numbers of us across the world. We truly can transform the way this world is going, the direction of of greed and anger and, you know, not enough and uh, scarcity and all of that kind of stuff. We can change this, but it's going to mm -hmm. take each of us making phenomenal changes within us and being willing to keep moving forward long enough for other people to be able to catch up with us and say, oh, look at look at that group over there. They're moving somewhere and I sure don't know where I'm going. Yeah. So maybe yeah. I'll just go with them. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, what, what what intrigues you and what pulls you, what, you know, listening to you, to those things that, that draw you. Uh, it's funny. I just started working with a, a coaching, a, a leader um, in an organization. And yesterday she was brainstorming, like, I want to bring more awareness of mental health into the organization. And I'm not sure what that looks like. And it's about, okay, partnering with me, with a coach to say, what are the possibilities? What, and if we don't know, where do we find those other answers? Yes. And, uh, and it, we got really excited. I mean, <laughs> yes. I'm so guilty of getting excited with my clients. You know? <laughs> I hang up from a call and I'm just like, I'm dancing around the room. Just like, <laughs> and I'm going, if anybody can see me now, <laughs> but it, I own it as much as they own it. Like that's how, mm -hmm. that's how beautiful it is. It's, um, it is. Uh, and, and mental health is a huge issue. And for me, it's not about um, fixing. Again, we got to stop with this fixing things. It's finding the way to uh, be preventative uh, and be consistent. And, uh, and there are ways around that. And, I've, and I'm trained again in mental, in, in mental fitness, uh, mental well-being. Uh, so those are things I bring to the table as well. And uh, those are areas that we need to look at. A thought yeah. that occurs to me is that when your goal is for the good of people, the good of, you know, the whole or whatever it is, as soon as we enter greed into that, all of the rest goes away. We cannot, we have to be serving. It has to be a sense yes. of service that we would oh. do this if we got nothing, you know, mm -hmm. back for it, yeah. uh, ourselves. Yeah. It's that kind of being so happy with your client because they are making progress and you're realizing, oh my goodness, I'm part of this. I'm part of yes. this journey. So it's that's so the, we kind of need to pull this to an end here. And so yes. I just want to see, you know, for Power Up Nursing, this has been a dream of myself and Tanya and Dr. Uh, Alba Rod Rodriguez, who are the three people who put it together, that we started dreaming this dream um, in January of 2020. And everybody knows what happened in March of that year. And so um, to be able to have this keep going, and it truly is Tanya who has pulled this thread through all of the stuff we've all been going through 
to make it happen. So I am so determined that at least 350 people get an opportunity to experience this in Orlando at that time with the kind of people who think the way that we are thinking and talking, they're going to experience it. And that's going to increase the number of people who want to make this happen. So and, and for their own needs. So yeah. what are your thoughts? What, why do you want people to come to power up and what do you think they need to hear to, to not just think about it, but actually get on the computer and register? Yeah. I think, first of all, it's dare to go where you've not gone before, um, because if you want some changes, you're part of making the decisions that are different than the ones you've been making. Yes. I think that's that's really important. Um, so it's and and also if we're working, go back to community. I know what it takes to put together a conference. I've done it before. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And and where this is coming from is coming from a place of love and great intentions. And we need to support each other. Mm -hmm. So, you know, instead of spending that, you know, whatever money that you need to, to, to spend on coming to the conference or how to get there, et cetera, it's that place of saying is, does this align with my views of what's needed and how we need each other? And am I willing to let that opportunity of coming together with a group of like-minded people go? Am I really willing to let that go? Mm -hmm. I have to ask myself that because even if we don't agree a hundred percent with each other, isn't that what fuels the next step wherever oh that is meant to happen? It's better if we don't agree with each other. <laughs> Absolutely. Or things we haven't thought of, you know, you, yeah, this is good, but here's something that might be better from my experience. So yeah, dare to go where you've not gone before, I think is, is a real big invitation here. Um, you know, make it twofold. Uh, one is go have fun, right? This is not meant to be, you know, like hard work. <laughs> if we go back to those words, right? Um, make it fun. But also, and I said this earlier this morning on my live stream, I said, be clear on your intentions. Mm -hmm. What is it you want to get out of this? You know, is it connecting with two people that you know are going to be your connections for life or for whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, what do I want for myself? What growth am I looking for? Because what you focus on will expand it will become a reality if you put it in there. My offer to everyone here, anyone who's listening uh, for the power up, anybody who's going, those who have even, even registered, if you're not clear on your intention, call me. Let's make an appointment. I will help you get clear on your intentions and help you get those intentions fulfilled. Do you want okay, to give a number? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, send, send me an email to uh, just alive in healthcare at gmail.com, alive in healthcare at gmail.com. I will get that email and I promise to give you the time to sit down and really set your intentions clearly for yourself because I want the success to be yours. It's not about power up nursing to be successful as a conference. It's about the individuals in that conference to be successful. That's it. That's, I mean, it. That's what it was and, always about. Yeah. And so get clear, get really clear on your intentions and what you want to walk away with. And we're going to make it happen. If we know more what you want, we're going to make it happen. Excellent. On that, we're going to end. And thank you so much for being together with me today. And thank you, Tanya, in the background for being the producer. Yes. Thank you so much, Leanne and Tanya. I really appreciate it. And I can't wait to see you in June. <laughs>